Job chapter number 38. It's a very interesting and uh, different chapter in the Bible. What you have is God interacting with man. You have God addressing Job specifically, and he inter he's interrogating Job, and he gives him a series of rhetorical questions which are not meant to be answered. The questions are simply asked just to prove the point of God's greatness. Now, the title of my sermon this evening is How Great is Our God? Now, immediately when I entitled that sermon, everyone who was pulled out of liberal churches, the first thing that popped into their mind, you know, you were saved from liberalism and now you're put into a fundamental, you got saved from when you got put into a fundamental Baptist church, right? You're pulled out of the fire. Now, the first thing that popped into your mind is, is I had to look up, so I didn't know who it was, but you had to, I, I had to look it up, and it's Chris Tomlinson, I guess, wrote a song, How Great Is Our God. Now, I knew that he entitled that I knew that was the title of the song. And I've heard the song actually, but I didn't really I heard it because I grew up in a Christian school. And they would sing that they would sing, you know, the series of uh, or the different types of CCM music in chapel on Wednesdays, Wednesday nights in high school. The Wednesday in the afternoon on high school. They, right after lunch is what we would have chapel. And uh, with that particular song. They would sing. I don't remember the lyrics to it. Of course you remember the, you know, the, the chorus because they repeated a million times, right? But I entitled it, How Great Is Our God, for a specific reason. Because I know how CCM music is. And I know, I know the type of music and I know how the lyrics work. And they're, it's very vain. There's a reason why we sing hymns. And I was just reflecting on that when we just sang Rock of Ages. It's my favorite hymn. It's an amazing hymn. It's so clear on salvation. And then right after that, what was the title of the song? I cannot remember. What was the other song that we just sang? I didn't know. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. It says Jesus completely saves. I mean, another great just, just statement that's clear about it's solely on Jesus. It's nothing that we do. It's just Jesus alone that saves, right? So I want this to serve multi-purpose for you. This sermon to serve a multi-purpose sermon for you this evening. You know, one, I want you to learn from the doctrine that's going to be taught. But number two, you can use this as an example of why we do not sing CCM music. And I have the lyrics here. And I want to read quickly the lyrics to that song to those that are not familiar with it. And I want you to see what, just how vain and how repetitious. It's very, it's very redundant in the words that are spoken. But most of all, it's just so empty. There's so meaning to it. There's no meaning to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the Bible. And we're going to look at what the Bible, when the Bible describes the greatness of God and the power of God. And how the Bible describes the majesty and the splendor of the Lord. So here, here are the, the lyrics to How Great Is Our God, written by Chris, song by Chris Tomlinson. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. Everybody's like, that's why you don't like that song. <laughs> the, the Lion and the Lamb. The Lion and the Lamb. The, uh, how great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. You see the just repetition of just like it's repeating so much. And, the, and there's, there's no substance to the words. It's not really telling you why he's great, Right? says this, name above all names, worthy of our praise, my heart will sing, how great is our God. You are the name above all names, you are worthy of our praise, and my heart will sing, how great is our God. How, I thought I just reread that on accident, but no, that's what it did, I really did. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see... Go ahead and guess what it says next. How great is our God? The world, the whole world sings, the whole world sings, how great is our God? How great is our God? How great, how great is our God? 
When you read it out, it's much worse than when you hear it. I mean, I've heard the song, but that's ridiculous. The redundancy is ridiculous. And the, all the songs are like this in the CCM. You know, the CCM style, that genre of music, contemporary Christian music, they're all like this. I've heard them. I went to a Christian school. They're all like this. That's why we don't sing. We sing the hymns of the faith. We sing the hymns that have doctrine. You can learn from them. I listen and I learn from them all the time. I realize, you know, all different types of things that are, that are taught in there and it will edify you. There's substance. There's content. And when we praise God, we need to know why we're praising. We need not just, just, we need to praise God with knowledge, the Bible talks about. We need to glorify God with knowledge. We need to know why he's great. Now, every sermon that I preach is meant to give glory to God. But tonight's sermon, the subject of the sermon in particular, is I want you to realize how great is our God. I really want you to realize how beyond our understanding he is. Just how great he is. We're going to look at all the passages that talk about how great, how large, how magnificent, just how great God is. And when you try to compare our God with the other gods. When you compare the Lord Jesus Christ with Buddha, it's ridiculous. When you take the Lord Jesus Christ and you try to compare him with Joseph Smith, it's embarrassing. When you take Jehovah and you compare him to any of these other religions, Krishna, it doesn't matter who it is, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to even look at. Our Lord, our God is the God of gods. He's the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is so much higher than all the gods of the, of the world. He's so much greater than the gods of the heathen. And when you read today, I want him to, you know, to when we read today, and we look at all the verses that speak about just how great and how magnificent God is, it should cause you to fear his name. Like we talked about in Malachi chapter number 2. It should cause fear to be in your hearts with how great God truly is. I want you to turn to Job chapter number 26, verse number 14. Job chapter number 22, verse number 16. One of the main topics discussed in the book of Job is the greatness of God. Again, that's Job chapter number 26, verse number 14. Now, I'm going to give you an introductory thought right now. It's also going to be the, the first point of the sermon. And I want you to carry this point throughout in tandem with the next couple of points that are given. The very first point here is that God is beyond our understanding. The God of the Bible is the only God that claims and says that he is beyond human comprehension. He is beyond the comprehension of our finite minds. You will never, you can search God out, you can study God, you can look into his nature, you can try to understand his character. You will never understand God while upon this earth. You will always, even in the future, even into a, in heaven, even in eternity, you will forever be you know, learning about God, about his greatness. Look at Job chapter number 26, verse number 14. Job chapter number 26, verse number 14 says this, Lo, these are the parts, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. And then it says, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Now I want you to back up, and I want to begin reading here. Let's look, actually, in verse number, verse number nine. So it says, "If he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them, he holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble." And are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power. So it's talking about the greatness of God. And by his understanding, he smite, he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. And then it says this. Lo, these are parts of his ways. These are just some things about it. This is just bits and pieces. Just parts of how he is. And then it says this but how little a portion is heard of him. I want that to sink in deep into your mind what he's actually saying. He's saying this, that this is just part of how great God is. This is just a little bit of the information about God's greatness. And then he says, at the, right after that, but how little a portion is heard of him. The amount that we know of God, even the amount that we know that's incomprehensible, that we cannot understand of God, it's only a small factor of who he is. It's only a small amount of the nature of God, and even that you can never comprehend. Even that you can never understand. How little, it says, how little a portion 
is heard of him. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 8. Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 8. Job 11, 7 says this. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? The word perfect or perfection in the Bible means complete or completion. So he's saying, he's asking again a rhetorical question. Can you find him out unto completion? Do you think that you can understand God fully or completely? It's rhetorical. There's no chance that you can do that. We could never understand an infinite God with the finite mind that we have. It says this, verse number 8, it is as high as heaven, speaking of the knowledge of God. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? The measure thereof, this is speaking of the knowledge of God, the measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. The first point is God is an incomprehensible God. He is beyond our understanding. Look at Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 8. It says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Verse number 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and he says, in my thoughts, than your thoughts. That alone is just a hard concept to grasp, to understand. He's saying that my thoughts are not even like how your thoughts are. My ways are not even like how your ways are. And you stop and you think about that for a minute, and I understand to an extent what, he's, what God is conveying to us. It's this. You know, have you ever thought about this? I believe like, uh, Ken Hovind said this. There's never a thought. How, how does it go exactly? There's never a thought that God has not had. Think about that for a minute. There's never a thought that ever occurred to God. There's never anything that has ever occurred to God. It's ever occurred to you that there's nothing that's ever occurred to God. Think about that for a minute. God never had a new thought pop into his mind. God never had a new idea that came into his, you know, his, his mind or into his you know, uh, um, you know, conscience, if you will. There is never, nothing that has ever just occurred to God. Oh, I never thought about that. He's never said that. God has from all eternity known all things. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 11, and we'll see this spoken of again. Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter number 11. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 11, verse, look at verse number 32. Romans eleven thirty-two. 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Now look at verse number 33. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So he says the depth of the, uh, and the riches of the wisdom, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his, way, are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So he's saying, how unsearchable are his judgments? They're unsearchable. You cannot understand his judgments. Judgments here is talking about his opinions, right? It's talking about the things that he believes or like judgments in this case too. You can even also liken this unto the law in the Old Testament. The law is likened unto, the, unto judgments, opinions, right? And then he says, in his ways, past, finding out. God's ways, God's judgments, how God operates, you know, the way that God's thoughts operate are beyond even our human understanding. We cannot ever, we will never be able to, especially on this earth, we will never be able to. To fully comprehend God's thoughts, God's ways, God's judgments, God's opinions, God's beliefs, if you will. We have such a great God, we cannot comprehend how God's mind works. The Bible says after that, verse number 34, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Think about that. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who's understood the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? What does that mean? Saying that there's never been anyone that's taught God. God, does, God has never been counseled. God never gets himself into a bind where he has to go to someone and say, what should I do in this situation? He is always the counselor. He is always the one that gives advice. He is always the one that helps the person that's in the bind. He is the counselor. Who's been his counselor? What's the answer? No one. God does not have a counselor. He is the great counselor. It says, for who had first given to him... And it shall be recompensed unto him again. Let that sink in for a minute. Who, who is there that gave something to God? Think about this for a second. If God exists before everything and everyone, it is not possible that a person, that there could be a person that God would owe something to. Because the only reason why everything that exists is here is because of him. Right. 
He brought everything into existence. So it's not possible that God could owe something to anyone. He is before all things. And then it says in verse 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 139. God's wisdom is beyond our understanding. It is beyond our understanding it's because it is imme ir immeasurable. Excuse me, immeasurable. He has all knowledge. That's Psalm 139. We're looking at verse 1. Psalm 139, verse 1. <clears throat> Second point is that God is omniscient. First point is that God, he is an incomprehensible God. He is so great you will never be able to comprehend God. He is incomprehensible. The second point is that God is omniscient. The word omni means all. Something is omnidirectional. It means it is in all directions, right? It means all. The word omni means all. The shit at the end of that comes from the word science. And science means knowledge. So he's omniscient. Meaning he has all knowledge. God has all knowledge. He knows all things. I want you to look here in Psalm chapter number 139. Let's look at verse 1. David says this, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting down -sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought of far off. Notice what he just said right there. Thou understandest my thought uh, far off, he's saying before David, before David even even thought something, before the, this a specific thought ever even popped into his mind, God already understood and knew that he was going to think that at that exact moment. He understood his thought. <clears throat> Look at verse three. Thou compass my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it. All together. He's saying that he's ne there's never been a word that he has spoken, that David has spoken, that God was not aware of. There's never been a single thing that you have said that God did not hear, that God did not know. There has never been a, a thought that has popped into your mind that God, you know, oh, missed that thought. You know, he wasn't paying enough attention. It doesn't work like that. God, God being a great God, being a God of heaven and a God of earth, sees, hears, understands, and knows every thought that every person has. Not only does he know every thought that every person has, he knows every word that every person has ever said. Any word that you've ever spoken off of your tongue, God knows that specific word. Look at verse number five. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high I cannot attain unto it. So notice he says that again. Such knowledge is too wonderful for, wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Saying it's beyond his comprehension. It's immeasurable. He's not able to even attain unto this knowledge of God. I want you to keep your hand here and flip over here in the book of Psalms. Just a couple of pages of Psalm chapter number 147. Psalm chapter number 147. Look at verse number 5. It says, great is our Lord and of great power. And then watch what it says. His understanding is infinite. The word infinite means immeasurable. Finite is a specific measurement. Infinite means that it is immeasurable. It, is, it, it has no ending is what it actually means. It has no ending. It is infinite. God's understanding is infinite. He is a God of infinite understanding. He knows all things. He is a God of omniscience. Jeremiah chapter number 1, verse number 5 says, Before I formed thee, this is God speaking unto Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. So God says unto Jeremiah, Before you were ever even born, I knew you. Think about that. Before you ever even existed. I knew who you were. I knew what your name was going to be. Just like he tells David, before a thought, a thought even popped into your mind, I knew what that thought was and I knew what thought you were going to think. Before that word ever even came off of your tongue, I knew what you were going to say. Everything that you've done, I know when you rise up in the morning, I know when you lay down, lay down at night. He knows all things about every person. He's a God of all knowledge. His understanding is infinite. And before Jeremiah ever even came about, before he was ever even a thought, God knew Jeremiah. That's an amazing thing. 
I want you to turn to, uh, let's go back to Psalm chapter number 139 there, where you have your hand. Psalm chapter number 139. Look at verse number 7. Verse number 7. The next point I want to make is God's omnipresence. Because he knows all things, he's also in all places at all times. Look at verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy by spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? And then he says this. If I ascend it up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the farthest points of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. So he's saying, if I were to go all the way to heaven, you're there. He picks the, the other furthest point. He says, if I were to go all the way to hell, behold, thou art there. He says, if I were to go to the uttermost parts of the sea, you're there. God is in all places at all times. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 3 says this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. And then it says, Beholding the evil and the good. That's a sobering thought to keep in mind. You know, when you think you're alone, you're not really alone. When you think that you're doing something, and maybe you're performing some act that you should not be doing, you're thinking something, saying something, God knows what you're thinking. God knows what you're saying. The Bible talks about that we're going to give an account for every idle word. That's important to keep in mind, that everything that's ever come off your tongue, every thought that you've ever had, every place that you've ever went, anything, God knows. God knows it all. God, when you think you're alone, God is beholding the evil and the good. That's a sobering thought to keep in mind. I want you to turn to Job chapter number 36, verse number 22. Job chapter number 30, 36, yes, uh, verse number 22. <clears throat> The next book to the left is the next book back. Job 36, verse 22. Our, the third point is the eternal existence, or I'm sorry, the fourth point. The eternal existence of God. The eternal existence of God. Look at Job chapter number 36, verse number 22. The Bible says, Behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined him his way? Or who can say, Thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great. Keep seeing this phrase come up when, when they're speaking of the majesty of God and all of the qualities of God which define divinity. And then it says this, God is great and we know him not. What's it saying? You cannot understand him. God cannot be understood. He's infinite. Neither, watch this, can the number of his years be searched out. Have you ever sat there and just tried to think about the thought of eternity? Have you ever tried to allow your mind to just trace back into eternity? It can be sometimes even an odd thought. It can go to a point where you're like, whoa, whoa. You know why? Because we're finite. We don't understand that. But God is a God that is of eternity past, eternity future. He is eternity. He has always existed and he will always exist. Jesus Christ said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning of and the end, saith the Lord. He says, I am, I am Alpha and Omega. He says, the beginning and the end. And then he says, I am the first and the last. That's why it says here, neither can the number of his years be searched out. You cannot search out the number of his years. There's never an ending. He never had a beginning. And atheists, they think they're clever. And they'll always ask just silly, stupid questions, right? They'll always ask questions like, well, if God made everything, then who made God? It's like, goodness sakes. If God was made or created, he's not God. Whatever made or created him would be God. And then you'd have just like this endless cycle, like of just like God's creating God. You know, you, it's, that's not how God works. You cannot comprehend God. God says in, uh, in Isaiah uh, 43, he says, uh, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. And then he says this, Before me there was no God formed, Neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There was no God formed before him. There was no God formed before him, and there will be no God formed after him. He is alone, the one Lord, the one God, the one Jehovah, the one creator of the universe. Amen. You know, there wasn't a God that created a God. You cannot comprehend God. I want you to turn to, i got another passage here. Go to Isaiah chapter number 57. Isaiah chapter number 57. The God of the Bible is eternal. 
The God of the Bible has always existed and will always exist. That's why God refers to himself as I am. What does that mean? He has always been. It has two meanings. He's eternal and he's self-existent. No one ever created him. No one ever made him. He has always existed. You can't search out the number of his days. He's the ancient of days. He's always been here. He will always be. He doesn't need something to keep him going. He is the Lord. His greatness is beyond your understanding. You can sit down and think about it all day, and you'll never understand how great God is. You'll never understand it. And if you're going to find out the greatness of God, it's sure as crap not going to be from Chris Tomlinson. Right. It's going to be from the Bible. The Bible will teach you and tell you God's greatness. And you know what the Bible says? You're never going to be able to find out the number of his, of his years. You're never going to be able to understand God's greatness and God's... One. That right there speaks to his greatness. He's incomprehensible to your human mind. He's so great. Look at Isaiah chapter number 57. Let me get there myself. Again, that's Isaiah chapter number 57. Notice this statement. Very interesting. Verse number 15, he says this. For thus saith the high and lofty one. Watch this. That inhabiteth eternity. Notice that. For thus saith the high and lofty one. What a powerful statement. That inhabiteth. He's saying, I live in eternity. You know where I dwell? I dwell in eternity. I am eternal. It's the only time the word eternity is used in the entire Bible. Eternal, everlasting is used. It's the only time eternity is ever... You know, if I ever want to look for this verse, I just type in eternity every, time, every single time. Find out where it's at. So he says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. And then he says, Whose name is holy. I love the way that God speaks. And people may look at God and they say, Oh, he's being proud. He's being proud. He can be. That doesn't apply to him. God is so great. God is so amazing. He can stand there and he can say, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. He is the creator of the world. Amen. He is. He's not. Here's the thing. Uh, you know, when we look at the, the commandments and the laws and things like that, a lot of those are for our benefit and for our practicality. Like when Jesus comes, Jesus was subject unto the laws of God, of course, as a man. But a lot of those are for our benefit. Something like, oh, God is being proud. That does, God, that doesn't work like that, my friend. God, you know, the reason why we would be proud is because we don't deserve to be, you know, why it would be a sin for us to be proud is because you don't deserve to be proud. We're talking about the creator of the universe, my friend. You know why you don't deserve to be proud? Because he's greater than you. That's why. That's why it's a sin in the first place. Right. God can speak in whatever manner he wants to be. And that actually brings me to my next point. <clears throat> Go to Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 17. Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 17. Very next book of the Bible. Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 17. God has all power. I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter number 29, verse number 11. It says this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Notice that. Everything is his. Everything in heaven, everything in earth, everywhere. He owns everything. It says, thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 17. It says this, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth, and by thy great power and stretched out arm. And then he says this, and there is nothing too hard for thee. What an amazing bunch of statements that we just continue to look at. Jeremiah looks at God and he says, You've made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and your stretched out arm. And he says that there's nothing too hard for you. You can do all things. He is the God of this universe. He created this universe. He can defy every law that he put into place. He can defy the three motion laws of Newton, quantum physics. It doesn't matter. Thermodynamics, he put those laws into place in the first place. Yeah, right. When the Lord comes and he steps on a ship, he can make it go to the other side immediately if he wants to. He can walk on water. He can defy gravity. He can do whatever he wants. Right. This world, you think that's amazing. It didn't exist without him. He spoke this world into existence. That same God, when he's standing on a ship and there's a great storm that arises, he can just say, peace, be still. That's his storm. That's his creation. He spoke that water into existence in the first place. It wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for him. The same way that he spoke, there was nothing, and then there was something, he can tell that water to be still whenever he feels like it. 
That's how great God is. You think Chris Tomlinson explains this? You think that he lets you know the true greatness of God? This CCM music, you know, that was a, meant to be a very, very, I keep bringing it up, but it was really meant to be like a side note. But, you know, there really are reasons why we sing those hymns, man. It's because they bring up the Bible, because they quote the Bible. If we're going to find out the greatness of God, we're going to find out from the Bible. And look at all these verses that just that explain he's, his, his knowledge is infinite. His understanding is even infinite. You cannot search out his under, the, his, the years of his days. He is the ancient of days. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. It says, you created the heaven and the earth by your stretched out arm and your power, and there's nothing too hard for thee. You see how great our God is truly. We have a great and amazing God. He's beyond our understanding. He is beyond our comprehension. He truly is an omniscient God. He truly is an omnipotent God. He truly is. He's an omnipresent God. He beholds the evil and the good. Amen. He's greater than any God that any religion ever has. He's the one and only true God. Right. And that's why when you read about I would expect the God of the universe that's able to speak the world into a universe. I would, I would expect that God to possess all power. I would expect that God to be a God who's all-knowing. And then you look at all these other religions, and, they, and they're obvious that they're man-made. But then you read about the God of the Bible, and you can see, man, this is a majestic God. This God stands out from these other gods. This God is not like these other gods. This God is truly a great and wonderful and amazing God, a God that is dreadful, a God that is fearful, a God that is beyond our understanding. His thoughts, his understanding is immeasurable. His years are... You can't, they're past searching. I want you to turn to, uh, go to Luke chapter number 1, verse number 36. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 1, verse number 36. <clears throat> Luke chapter number 1, verse number 36. It says this, Luke chapter 1, verse 36. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth. <clears throat> She hath also conceived a son in her old age. This is an angel speaking unto Mary before Jesus. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. And then it says this. For with God nothing shall be impossible. It's the same God that Jeremiah served. He said nothing was too hard for him. Nothing is impossible for God. You know, a lot of people will, will uh, you know, misunderstand this and they'll take this to an all new level. Saying that God can do anything. And that's actually not true. There's two times in the Bible that God tells you there's something God cannot do. Number one, just in general, God is a righteous God. The Bible says that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. God cannot sin, right? The Bible is very clear, like Titus chapter 1, verse 2, says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God cannot do something that is inherently unrighteous, that is inherently wrong or morally wrong. God cannot do that, right? Uh, and, uh, I believe it's Numbers chapter 23, it also says, maybe 19, chapter 19 or chapter 23, Numbers says uh, that, that God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. So God will not lie. God cannot lie. God is not a sinner. God is not unrighteous. God is a righteous God. It's not the God of Calvinism. God of Calvinism, they say, he, that he, when they interpret that verse, that I, I think I quoted this this morning where it talks about how he, he said, I create peace and I make evil. It gives you the definition of evil in that exact verse. It's the opposite of peace. It's talking about war, right? It's talking about like when God says that he repented of the evil that he thought that he was going to do unto Nineveh. It's talking about like the harm. He's talking about physically hurting them, right? So when that says that he, when he's talking about he's the God, he said, I create peace and make evil. He's saying I create peace and I make war, you know, harmful things, right? He's saying that he is the God of everything, right? I want you to... Uh, Turn to, you go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter number 8. This will be the last point. Go to Psalm chapter number 8. I'm going to read to you from Job chapter number 5, verse number 9. It just speaks of God's infiniteness. Infiniteness. It says this in Job chapter number 5, verse number 9. Which doeth great things, speaking of the Lord. Which doeth great things and unsearchable. And then it says this. Marvelous things. Without number. Just saying it's without number. We saw that his, that his understanding is infinite. His understanding is infinite. I want you to look here in Psalm chapter number 8. Psalm chapter number 8. 
Psalm chapter number 8. Now that we've looked at the greatness of God, we've seen that He's omnipotent, that He's, number one, He's beyond our comprehension. We saw that God is omnipotent. He has all power. We saw that God has all knowledge. He is omniscient. We, so, we see that God is a righteous God. We see that God is, is omnipresent. We see the greatness of God, truly. He's a great, you know, majestic God of great splendor. But I want you to keep that in mind, and then I want you to look here in Psalm chapter number 8. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Look at Psalm chapter number 8. Look at verse number 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Look at verse 3. Watch this. When I consider thy heavens... The work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars, which thou hast ordained. So he's saying, when I look at the creation, and I think about it, and I consider it, right? And he says in verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? So he stops. David says, you got to think that David really wrote this. He, look, he stops and he looks around. The same man that said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I believe this is in this chapter. It was in the chapter we read earlier. Uh, he says, I stop and I look around and I consider the heavens and I look at the earth and I just look at the magnificent creation that you have created. I can see your power in it. And then I compare that and I look at myself and you can see the humility of David. And he says, what is man? If you're able to do this and you're so great that you can create this. What is man? Like, what am I? What do I matter? He's saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? When you, when you take it a step further, you think about this. Think about the same God who is truly omnipotent, who has all power, right? That that God came and was born on this earth. That you look at the God that is omniscient, the God who knows all things. That Lord came and was born and became a baby. The Bible says that he grew in wisdom. He left his glory in heaven. You know, he, he was in the th on the throne in heaven, left his glory there, and he came and was born in a manger. That's a trough, if you're we're not familiar with that, never knew that. That's what a manger is. It's where, it's where animals eat out of. That's where Jesus was born. So he left the throne, he left heaven and the glory of heaven, and he came, he was born here. He forsook, in a way, of course, we know that he was obviously in heaven, raised the mystery of godliness, but he forsook heaven and came and was born on this earth as a baby. And he grew in wisdom. That same God that knows all things. The God, the big God that says that he holds all evil and all good. He fills everything. He's in heaven, he's in hell, he's everywhere. The uttermost parts of the sea... That God, says, grew in stature. The God that fills all things, the big God, he grew in stature. Think about that. The God that created everything. He spoke this world into existence. The God that, that created the seas and divided the seas, right? That same God was hanging on the cross and uttered the words, I thirst. The God that created the water that's on that earth in the first place. I mean, think about that. Amen. That God. And you think, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? David, I don't know if he did or he didn't truly understand in what way he would truly visit us. That he himself would come and abide among us and call us brethren. And humble himself to that point. You know, to the point where God, not only did, you know, did he create the oceans and all the waters and all the fountains and said, I thirst. Not only that, what, happened, what did he say in the, in the wilderness? It says that he was afterward and hunger. The Bible says that he's the God. He says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He created all the food of the earth. And he, got to, he came down and put himself through the trials of this life and said that he was hungry. You know, the God that, you know, hast thou not heard? Hast thou not, you know, uh, hast, hast thou not heard that the, the, God, the great Lord... Who is, I can't remember how it goes, but, you know, but it talks about that, he's not, he, that he doesn't faint. And then it says, neither is weary. 
Bible talks about it not being weary. But what does it say about Jesus when he's going to Samaria? It says he, he sat thus on the well because he was weary. I mean, think about how he truly visited us. I mean, think about the full extent to, of the greatness. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visit? David is just saying, I look at your greatness. I see your majesty, your power, everything that you were able to create. He's just saying, why do you even interact with us? What is man? But you know what God actually did? God, that great God, came down. That amazing God with all power, he set that aside and he came down and was born on this earth as a man. The God that spoke the world into existence, the God that has all power. Think about that. He put, he put that aside and he came down and was born on this earth as a man. It just shows you how much that God truly loves us and cares for us. Right? Psalm chapter number 113, verse number 5 says this. <clears throat> Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? So it speaks of his greatness and how high that he is. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? And then it says this. Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. So it says he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 says this. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, <clears throat> he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when we actually understand, you know, the, just the greatness of God, how great our God truly is, we understand that his ways are past finding out. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His greatness is far beyond what we can even comprehend. He's omnipotent. There's nothing too hard for God. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows the thoughts that you have. Understand that first, and then look, and then consider how God visited us. Then look, and then understand that God was willing to set that aside. The Lord of heaven and of earth was willing to come down and be born on this earth. As a baby. Not only be born on this earth, but he was willing to take your punishment upon you, upon himself. Think about that. The God of the universe, he has all power. He set that aside. He said, you know what? I'm going to come and I'm going to die on the cross for Josh Hall. I'm going to die for Anthony Wells. I love them so much. I'm going to do that. I mean, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visits him? You know, we serve a great and a wonderful and an amazing God. He truly is. And we shouldn't stop saying, you know, you know, how great is our God just because the CCM music. How many times did you see that? How great is the Lord? How great is our God? That's a statement that's in the Bible many times. How great is God? Over and over and over again. God is great. God is magnificent. You know what we should praise Him. You know what we should do? We need to first understand how great He truly is and in what way the Bible teaches that. And really get an idea of how the Bible tells you. It's immeasurable. You can't search out his ways. He inhabits eternity. He is amazing. And then it's that much sweeter when you understand what he's willing to do for you. When you understand that he's willing to come and to die on the cross for you. You know what? Just like always, the glory that we give to that great and wonderful and amazing God comes through who? It comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes through what he did as a man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man that thou visitest. And we need to have that humble attitude before a great and almighty God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we, we're thankful that we serve the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We're thankful that you came down, dear Lord. You were, you were made like unto your brethren, dear Lord, and that you, you partook of the flesh of Abraham. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we love you. We, we thank you for everything you've done for us. Help us to, to grow in understanding how great you are and to use that to glorify and worship and serve you even the more, dear Lord. We love you and be with us, and uh, we ask you that you would keep us safe and help us just to be pleasing to you, help our church to grow, help us to get many saved. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to grow in knowledge of your word so that we can worship and serve you even more. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.